Twitter. Uh, remark um, or note the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, without this uh, transformative piece of legislation, I know that I would not.
Uh, remark um, <clears throat> or note the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, without this uh, transformative piece of legislation, I know that I would not be standing on this stage in front of you today. Um, we are also here to celebrate nine champions of change for disability advocacy across generations. And to kick off our celebration, I'd like to introduce Senior Advisor Valerie Jarrett. is a champion for Opportunity for All, and I'm very proud to call her my boss. Yeah. Oh, that was really sweet. Thank you, Maria. Good morning, everyone. We are so excited to have you here. It has been quite a week uh, with our celebrations. The president had a terrific reception last week, and we had a cross-section of people uh, from across the country who came to help celebrate, and he charged them with doing more just last night. Maria and I were at the Kennedy Center where we had a celebration uh, with Senator Harkin, who I know many of you know, pens the bill. We gave shout outs to Congressman Hoyer. Uh, we honored Jean Kennedy Smith and all of the work that she has done. And so we've had really a week of celebrations. But I have to tell you, one of the best events that we do here are Champions of Change. And the reason why is because it gives us a chance to put the spotlight on ordinary people across our country who are doing just absolutely extraordinary things and, be, and really provide inspiration and beacons of hope and there's no better flattery than invitation so our hope is that for the nine of you there are going to be 9,000 and then 900,000 and 9 million who will follow in your footsteps and, uh, and get a bit of that energy and chemistry from you to feel this sense of responsibility to give back to the community. So before my remarks go any further, I want to take a chance to highlight each of our champions and, uh, and be recognized. And they are an extraordinary, as we like to say, uh, intergenerational group. So to begin with, there's Dil Shad Ali. Dil, hands up. Dil is an advocate with the Virginia Autism Project. 
She helped facilitate the passage of landmark autism insurance legislation, and she's also worked with Enable Muslim and Mushin, the first ever disability advocacy organization focusing on creating uh, programs of inclusion, mentoring, and resource sharing in the American Muslim community. So congratulations to you. Round of applause. Next, we have Mike Ellis. Mike is the National Director of Sprint Relay, where he works to create innovative solutions that increase communication and information access for people who are hearing impaired. Mike? Where's Mike? There you are. All right. There's Mike. Next, Sandy Ho. Sandy is a disability youth advocate, and she's been key in developing the Easter Seals Thriving Mentoring Program for young women with disabilities and founded Thr Letters to Thrive, an international project where disabled women around the world share life experiences through letters to their younger selves. Sandy. <laughs> We also have Catherine Hutchinson. Catherine had a brain stem stroke at the age of 43, and the stroke left her quadriplegic and nonverbal. Kathy was institutionalized and shared her experience while serving as a named plaintiff in the class section Hutchins versus Park. As a result of her efforts, a statewide settlement agreement secured access to home and community-based services for hundreds of other Massachusetts residents with acquired brain injury. We're so delighted to honor you, Catherine. Next, we have Talila A. Uh, Talila a. Lewis. Talila is an activist and an attorney whose research is focused on creating equal access to the legal system for individuals who are deaf and who are deaf and people with disabilities. Talia advocates with and for hundreds of deaf defendants, prisoners and returned citizens, and trains justice, legal and correctional professionals about the varied disability related concerns. Please join me in recognizing <laughs> Next, we have Brian Mirma, who is a sophomore at Cornell University, where he started an assistive technology blog to help others with disabilities learn about available resources. Please join me in recognizing Brian. <laughs> also, we have Maxwell Barrows, who is a young man with autism who works for the Green Mountain Cell Advocates. It's a disability rights organization in Vermont, and as the outreach director, he mentors youth and adults with developmental disabilities to speak up for themselves and become leaders. Please join me in recommending, recognizing that. <laughs> Next, we have Dior Vargas, a mental health activist. She is a crisis text line crisis counselor. That's a mouthful. A crisis text line crisis counselor and a facilitator for the Young Adult Support Group, a national alliance on mental illness, NYC Metro. Please join me in recognizing you. Please, everybody, as a group, is this an extraordinary group of champions to change our world? <laughs> So, as I hope you know, since first taking office, President Obama has worked very hard to deliver on behalf of the community of people with disabilities and to increase opportunity for all Americans. He believes we should all be defined by our abilities and not defined by our disabilities. On February 12th, the President signed an executive order to raise the minimum wage for workers on a new and replacement federal contracts to up to $10.10.10 .10 for everyone 
Under current law, workers whose productivity is affected because of their disability may be paid less wage, less in wages and than others for doing the exact same job, and he thought that was not right and not fair, and so he changed it. Under the new executive order, all people working under service, construction, and concession contracts with the federal government will make at least a minimum of $10.10. That's good news. We are also very proud that the president wants to lead by example in the employment arena. And there are more people with disabilities working in the federal government now than any time in the last 32 years. Our work is not done, and we will continue that effort until the last day we are here. We believe that diversity is a strength. Our country, our country and our federal government should reflect the diversity, richness of diversity of our population, and we have made a very intentional, conscious effort of making sure to recruit people with disabilities in the administration. The president also believes that all people deserve affordable health care. Hopefully that doesn't come as a surprise to anybody. We're really rather proud of Obamacare. We're delighted that it's called Obamacare because he does care. We are particularly pleased that insurance companies can no longer discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions or impose annual or lifetime caps just when you need it most, historically, insurance was not available. And now for every single American, having been tested not once, but twice at the Supreme Court, affordable care is here to stay. And so I guess in closing, I want to say to you that uh, as we reflect upon the president's approach, his philosophy since the day he's been in office, in fact, since the day he started as a community organizer on the south side of Chicago, is to make sure that every voice is heard in our country, even the softest voices, to speak for those without voice who have historically been left behind. And he wants to make sure that every person gets that fair shot, regardless of zip code, regardless of race, regardless of religion, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity, and regardless of your ability or disability. If you're prepared to work hard in our country, you should get that fair shot. That reflects his values. He, be he believes it reflects the values of our country. It's what makes us strong. It's what makes us competitive. It's what makes us great. It's what makes us decent and good, too. And those are all important. And sometimes in this town, the decent and good gets left by the side, which is why we're so glad to have all of you. You're a constant reminder of why we work so hard, on whose behalf we're fighting. You keep our focus as it should be on the long haul. And your work just makes us so proud of each and every one of you. So to the champions, I say congratulations. To those of you who are here supporting the champions, they couldn't be champions without you. To those of us who are watching our live stream, which we enjoy broadcasting across the country, who couldn't be here, I hope in your hometowns you will celebrate these champions by finding your own champions and hold them up as we hold up the folks who are here with us today. So thank you very much, and I'm going to turn it back over to Maria. Thank you so much for those words, Valerie. I'd now like to introduce Cecilia Munoz. Cecilia is the head of our Domestic Policy Council. Many of the achievements that Valerie mentioned in her remarks would not have been possible without Cecilia's leadership. So Cecilia, welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to start by echoing um, Valerie's warm welcome to you all. We're really, really excited to have you here. This is an important day. This is a hugely important milestone. And we also know that we have hugely important work still ahead of us, so it's it's good to take a moment to step back and reflect on how far we've come uh, and to use that as motivation for the work ahead. Um, so congratulations to our Champs of Change, and thank you so much um, for your inspiration and for all of your hard work. Um, when uh, President Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act into law, he said, 
With today's signing of the Landmark Americans with Disability Act, every man, woman, and child with a disability will pass through once closed doors into a bright new era of equality, independence, and freedom. And I know that some of you today um, were there on the South Lawn on July 26, 1990. Um, it was one of the largest bill signings the White House ever hosted. Um, so 25 years um, is an important milestone. Um, and it, so it's important to celebrate the 25th anniversary of this transformative law. It's resulted in greater civil rights for 56 million Americans living with disabilities today. And this victory was the result of a lot of hard work by a lot of courageous people um, to make sure that, as the president likes to say, we continue on our path to becoming a more perfect union, um, that we make sure that the American dream is accessible to all. So President Bush's comments were impassioned, they were eloquent, and some of the most powerful voices in the continued struggle for disability rights come from the people who are most affected by the structural barriers that people with disabilities face. That's why we're here today. And that's why we celebrate Champions of Change. You are unique um, because we are honoring individuals across generations, some of whom have been advocating for disability rights for decades, and others who are the next generation of leadership who are going to carry on this struggle for decades to come. Every day, people with disabilities make tremendous contributions to our country. And one of the ways in which our champions of change today contribute to the country is by moving the needle on access, equity, and inclusion beyond just the space of compliance. Uh, these champions are the embodiment of something that Justin Dart, who is the father of the ADA, said. The ADA is only the beginning. It's not a solution. Rather, it's an essential foundation on which solutions will be constructed. In other words, the ADA is a baseline. It tells us what we should be aspiring to, but simple protection under the law isn't sufficient unless we make accessibility real to all people uh, all across the country. So the law is an important foundation. It's a statement of our values. It's the construct on which we build, but the building is tremendously, tremendously important. And this president is really determined to make sure that we are inclusive of people with disabilities as part of his larger vis vision of making sure that we really realize the dream in this country, that the, this notion of no matter who you are, um, uh, you, you have a chance to get ahead if you're willing to work hard. So that includes things like the president's commitment to things like family leave or closing the pay gap for women, to creating common sense immigration reform. This idea is that we as a country, as a people, are committed to opportunity for every single American. And that includes Americans with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Providing greater opportunity for Americans with disabilities is inextricably linked to each individual's success, but it's also linked to the success of our local communities and to our nation as a whole. And to be honest about it, if we're really being truthful, we are leaving tremendous talent on the table in the United States today. Only 62% of students with disabilities graduate from high school on time. And when workforce participation rates among people with disabilities remain at 20%, and even when those Americans with disabilities who are working full-time continue to experience persistent wage gaps, it's clear that we're leaving talent on the table and that we need to do more to address the structural and attitudinal barriers that hinder not only the success of Americans with disabilities, but the success of the nation as a whole. Mm -hmm. This administration is working really hard to address those barriers. That's part of why we're here today. This is a celebration, but it's also a moment to uh, help us remember to rededicate ourselves to the work ahead. So a major barrier for students with disabilities receiving high-quality education, particularly post-secondary education, are entrance exams. These high-stakes tests can be nerve-wracking for anybody, whether you have a disability or not. But when you add the additional effort it often takes to receive basic testing accommodations, many students feel defeated before they even take their test. The same is true for entrance exams for professional certificates, uh, certifications or credentials, sometimes even job applications. So later this month, the Department of Justice is going to release technical assistance to provide guidance on testing accommodations for people with disabilities who take standardized exams and other high-stakes tests. <laughs> so the document's going to describe the responsibilities of testing entities that offer exams or courses related to applications, licensing, certification, or credentialing for secondary, post-secondary, professional or trade purposes. It's an important step forward, and we're proud of the DOJ for putting this forward. Another tangible legacy of the Americans with Disabilities Act is accessible public transit. So when I use a bus, 
I expect it to kneel down and accommodate my neighbors who use wheelchairs. And yet, even when people can receive high-quality education and make it through required exams, too many people with disabilities lose out on employment because they can't access accessible public transit to get them to their jobs. To address this, the Federal Transit Administration will soon announce the Mobility Services for All Americans Deployment Planning Project which will showcase promising technologies and practices that improve travel planning and coordination for people who need specialized transportation. <laughs> Valerie mentioned the promising results of the President's executive order on federal hiring of people with disabilities. More people with disabilities in federal service now than in the last 30 years. Let that sink in because it's really great news. And some even better news is that in the coming months, the EEOC intends to issue a notice of proposed rulemaking to amend its regulations implementing Section 501 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which requires the federal government to engage in affirmative action for people with disabilities. So this rule is going to complement new regulations under Section 503 that require federal contractors to take affirmative steps to recruit hire, promote, and retain workers with disabilities. These increased regulations also require increased data collection and record keeping to, promote, to improve employer accountability. So I work at the Domestic Policy Council. I am a policy wonk by nature. And new proposed rules, the, ex uh, the expansion and the more specificity around Section 503, collecting data, releasing data, these are all very wonky policy kinds of objectives. They are tremendously important because the, the point that we're making within the federal government and for federal contractors is you shouldn't be leaving talent on the table. You should have a plan for recruiting and hiring and retaining and promoting people with disabilities. That's the idea, and we're moving forward both with respect to federal hiring but also with respect to federal contractors. Again, because uh, these are... Um, important because of the contributions that people have to make and because the more inclusive our workforce is, the more successful we all are. So this is a commitment that the president is making um, and these are, will be part of the president's legacy again on making sure that we continue to become a more perfect union. So thank you very much. It also gives me great pride to say that uh, leaders, um, disability leaders, have contributed to our conversations on community policing, and that the White House recently hosted a meeting to begin to determine how we can better support LGBT youth with mental health needs. The whole conversation on policing is incredibly important, and it needs to include leadership from the disability community if we're going to help local police forces around the country get it right. So. Today is about celebrating and honoring the work of hardworking and inspiring leaders from around the country. Today is also about celebrating and recognizing 25 years of an important milestone in our country's civil rights history. But I really want you to hear from those of us at the White House that today is also very much about the work that is still ahead of us. We are not yet where we need to be. Uh, and, and we know that that's true. We know that that requires work and it requires leadership. And as much as today is about celebrating that kind of leadership which has brought us to this point and which will take us into the future, the, what Champions of Change Events does for those of us who work here in the administration is provide inspiration. It helps us redouble our commitment to the work ahead. Uh, it gives us hope. Um, and I, I suspect we take at least as much, if not more, um, than the, those who are celebrating around the country because we learn so much from all of you. We take so much inspiration from all of you. That's what gives us the energy for the hard work that's still ahead. I have the great honor of working for a president who has worked every day and has energized his team every day around this notion of becoming a more perfect union and around the notion of what it means if we are really opening doors so that everyone can contribute to their fullest potential. It is the thing which makes us great. It is the thing which strengthens us. Those challenges are constantly transforming. We are constantly learning from each other. Um, but that is really what this country is about. And our ability to make sure that all people of all abilities are able to contribute is, is central to who we are and who we will become. So I thank you and congratulate you, Champions of Change, for your hard work and for your inspiration. Thank you all very much for your work ahead. Thank you, Cecilia, for your remarks and for your continued leadership. 
Um, so I'd now like to bring together the first panel of champions to the stage. And as we do that, um, I'd like to shift some people around. So if we could get um, folks who are in the doorway to come up and around to the back of the room. And then anyone else um, who can take a seat. There are a few open seats in the room. So <clears throat> let's get you all in here and comfortable. Um, so for our first panel will be moderated by Judy Human and will feature Sandy Ho, Dilshad Ali, Dior Vargas, Doug Garner, and Brian Mirzma. I was like, I'm blanking on names, I'm sorry. Um, so you all heard a bit about each of the champions in um, Valerie's opening remarks. I'd like to take a moment to introduce Doug Garner, who is a staff person at the University of Texas Arlington and has dedicated most of his career to inclusive athletics. Go Mavs, he signs all of his emails. <laughs> And Judith Human, many of you probably already know very well, but she is a longtime leader in the disability rights movement and has had many positions and worn many different hats, but currently she is the special advisor for international disability rights at the U.S. Department of State and the first person to ever hold this position. So Judy and champions, please take it away. Thank you. definitely concur with uh, Brian's statements. Uh, in terms of mental illness, it's an invisible disability, and a lot of people think that there is a look. You know, when you say, I live with depression, they say, well, you don't look depressed, or it, it, it's not a certain appearance, I think. And so uh, trying to remove the stigma when it comes to that, uh, so, so I definitely agree with that. An obstacle that you faced and what you've done about it. I think that... Um the stigma of disability is one thing that prevents a lot of acceptance at the college level. And so I keep talking about education, but I think that uh, educating people on our campuses will help us with really one of the main obstacles in growing new opportunities is funding. And so educating others on why this is important and why we need to continue to grow these programs helps us when we go to our administrations across the country and say these are important programs that need to be um, considered for this population. And college campuses should not be discriminating against students who have disabilities, right? So it's something that unfortunately you feel like you're going begging for the funding which they need to put forward, to forward anyway. Um, yeah. Um. I would say, I wouldn't really call it an obstacle, but I think one of the biggest challenges that I faced is um, trying to strike that balance when you are uh, using narratives and storytelling to really put forth an honest, uh, an honest portrayal of, of living with a disability and how it is for not just for the, the person living with it, but for the entire family is, um, you know, really balancing when you're in that role of a caregiver. And, and not wanting to make the story about yourself, 
but it's really the story of the person who's living with the, with the disability. And it's a, it's a difficult balance and it's a difficult challenge to strike because when your loved one is the one who, again, not non-communicative, but non-verbal, you know, and, um, and is not advocate, you know, or we're working to get him to advocate for himself, but he's not in a position to do a lot of self-advocacy yet. And, uh, when we share the stories and we talk about things, I, and, and people come back and, and they address me, I'm like, it's not about really me, it's really about him and it's about the community itself and what, what are the best ways to create programs of inclusion and change that are the right programs because there have been inclusionary programs that he's, my, my child has gone through in school or in different situations that were not done the right way. And, you know, inclusion to be done has to be done the right way. And what that right way is is not the answer that I have here today, but it's an you know it's an ongoing process and it's a evolution of things that we're learning as a community, um, and that's been the biggest challenge for me to be able to find that balance between being the advocate, being the supporter, being the mother, but not being the story, you know. But I think it's okay that you're part of the story as part a mother of, of a younger fine. child. Yeah, part of it is okay. But so it's this transition issue, yeah. I think. Um, you know, when you're a parent, you have a responsibility for dealing with your children. Um, and then I think what many of us believe, it's really important to be able to make these transitions so that as individuals are becoming older, like your son, exactly. that we, as Brian, I think very nicely said, try another way. Um, I mean, these are the challenges we face in the Muslim community as well, because it's, it's really comes from a perspective of what the supporters and the parents and the elders and what is everyone thinking but really what is it like for the person who's living with it what are their needs what and how and how will things be effectively good for them yeah and i i think you know these the family is affected by what goes on and the dynamics and the age issues and how you transition from the role of a mother father to a role of the individual with disability i think those are all interesting areas you're still working on yeah you want to say well, it's also the next generation too, not just the ones that we're working with now, but making it easier for that next generation to come through and have some of these things that um, that we're starting to grow. And the evolution, I think, is a great word to use. Yes. Um, one of the obstacles that I came across in my work with the mentoring program, and I think it's an obstacle that some of the other disability advocates probably face as well is that um, the goal of this mentoring program was to empower young women to become successful adults. And that word empowerment can be very confusing. And, and there is not really a set definition, I, I don't think. And um, it gets thrown around a lot, especially in the disability community. And so my obstacle was to present to the young women as many examples of empowerment as possible. Um, because in my work, I, I definitely consider myself a mentee in the program. Like, I'm, I'm been learning as much from the mentors, um, you know, as the mentees themselves. And so I approached the, this issue by really just trying to present as many examples of successful older women, um, you know, disabled women who are attorneys, who are Paralympians, who are bloggers, who are advocates. For moms, um, you know, just letting them know that there's no one set answer. And again, the point that Brian has raised initially, um, approaching the issue from as many possible ways. Great. And the last question is, um, as we think about the future of the disability rights movement, what strategies should we be considering employing in the area of advocacy? Who'd like to go first? Brian? Um, I think it, it's important to take advantage of the fact that there's power in numbers and uniting uniting people with disabilities together to make their voice louder and make their voice heard um, in places that matter with, with policymakers and people who are responsible for enforcing the laws. Um, so that's the strategy that I would say. Thank you. So I think that there needs to be uh, more discussion of mental illness when it comes to disabilities. Um, despite the broadening of the definition of disability in the ADA, I think that 
people don't necessarily associate mental illness as a disability, considering that it's, it's an invisible one. And so I think that we need to associate that because the cultural norms, we don't view that as a disability. And I think that people need to realize that because I don't think people know that their rights, that they do have rights and that they necessarily have rights within the ADA. I also think that uh, cultural competency is extremely important as well. Um, so that there are so many things that we could definitely work on. Could you talk a little bit more about cultural competency than what you think we should be doing? Sure, absolutely. Uh, in terms of co cultural competency in my personal experience, I went through multiple therapists, and I think that my best experiences were with therapists who were Latina, specifically for me. I felt that I could be more myself. I felt that I could use certain language that maybe other therapists wouldn't understand. And so that was a very positive experience for me. Even in just, just beyond mental health care, health care in general, I think that with cultural competency and emphasizing that in training for mental health professionals, I think that the care can, can be improved because then people will not be as uh, distrusting of the of doctors and of other professionals because they feel that their beliefs and their faith and all these other things that they that are so ingrained in, in who they are will be respected and viewed as important. Thank you. I think moving forward, continued exposure is so important in, in all areas. Uh, exposure of the programs that are out there, the possibilities of um, maximizing the abilities of people with disabilities. Uh, one of the funnest things that happened in our program last year was one of our girls was chosen for the Play Like a Girl campaign. And it's so powerful to see the commercial and she comes around the corner in her wheelchair with her jersey on and she says, I play college basketball. And how many people never would have thought of that opportunity out there? So I think growing exposure um, is part of that evolution of growing opportunities and acceptance. This is a question of ignorance. Do we have any professional wheelchair basketball teams? Europe is the hotbed of professional wheelchair basketball. Yeah. In the um, U.S. Do in we the U.S., um, probably not yet. Yeah. They have some great teams. I met a woman in Finland who studied in the United States and played professional wheelchair basketball in Germany and got paid to do it. You know, I, at the event that I was at yesterday, the interfaith event, you know, it was interesting in, in the research that we, I did on the ADA to find out how faith communities and houses of worship were exempt from ADA. And, not um, in every state. I've every also state. found out that California uh -huh. has a law which doesn't exempt. Yeah. California. <laughs> we'll change the law here. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I think, you know, uh, in regards to, you know, our faith communities, probably the some of the most uh, looking forward effective strategies is to, to continue to be as public and as vocal as possible and to encourage um, encourage the youth, you know, those who are living with special needs and disabilities to take charge of their own lives and to take charge of their own voices as much as they can in whatever ways that they can and to be able to be vocal about what their needs are and what changes they need to see happen that will help make their lives be a more better, accessible, inclusive, uh, independent, and, uh, you know, fulfilling life. Um, the more, I think, you know, self-advocacy can grow, the better it is. And the more, you know, us as caregivers and supporters and family members and loved ones can help facilitate that happening, then that's the only, you know, there could, could only be positive change coming out of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I agree with Doug that the importance of exposure is so critical moving forward, um, especially as we are mentoring and teaching this younger generation um, and the importance of carrying on the fight for disability rights. Um, I think that, you know, also moving forward um, to expand the conversation around disabilities. Um, right, and not just to focus on those concrete concepts that are so measurable in terms of like housing and education and employment, and not to say that those are not totally important to our lives and our success, but also to talk about things that are not as measurable um, and are not that we can't really put our finger on and say, okay, we're going to convene this task force to measure the data on on 
um, you know, how many uh, disabled women are getting um, accessible um, preventative health services and, and how many of those conversations are happening around our public schools and sort of those conversations are also um, really important as well moving forward and um, yeah. So for me, uh, there are a couple of messages that have come out. Um, try another way, which is something that we should all be not only speaking about, but I think putting forth different ways of addressing issues, certainly in the field of education, uh, ensuring that a teacher isn't looking to teach all children the same way is critical. Whether there are any disabled children in the class or not doesn't matter. All children do not learn the same way. I very much agree also on issues of uh, power in numbers and power in uh, cross-disability. And the points that came up here frequently uh, addressing the issue of hidden disabilities and visible disabilities, this is a very critical issue. I completely agree. Uh, most people in the United States and around the world do not realize that most people's disabilities are not visible disabilities, and the ability to help people who have invisible disabilities to feel empowered to speak out um, Can for you make your case? and to look at obtaining their rights, I think is also what ADA is really all about. And um, it's, we're looking, I think, now at a very interesting set of dynamics. Working locally, I think, is very important. Know who your neighbor is, being able to work in a community, but social media is also something which is really gives us tremendous opportunities. I'd like to thank all of you for your great insight and for being chosen as champions of change and look forward to working with you. WrestleMania 30, the night my client, Rock West, conquered The Undertaker's undefeated streak at that WrestleMania. Item number three, the Monday Night Raw directly following WrestleMania 30, because let's face it, it's not just the fact that my client, Rock Lesnar, took the streak away from the Undertaker. It was up to me to rub salt in that mood. We hate to say we told you so, but ladies and gentlemen, we told you so! Item number four. The day after SummerSlam 2014, where my client, Brock Lesnar, took John Cena's WWE World Heavyweight Championship in which I coined... Can we get another round of applause for that panel, please? I would actually advise you... I have to say, like many of you, I've gone to a number of events this um, past Cena week that featured conversations around where we've been, where we're going, and I really, again, have to applaud those champions and Judy for the insights that they showed because they were unique and powerful and uh, very, very insightful. I would now like to welcome someone who is probably familiar to many of you if you're a sports fan. I'd like to welcome Mr. Jim Abbott to the stage. Race this planet. Run, of course, by Paul the advocate. Jim is a former baseball pitcher who played, um, although he was born without a right hand. He played and 10 seasons in Major League Baseball for the California here. Angels, New York the Yankees, w Chicago w White Sox, and Milwaukee Brewers and from 1989 way, to 1999. Welcome. In one take. Jim. Well, hello, everybody. Morning. I hope some of you will forgive me the fact that I was a Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I played baseball 
play for enough teams to kind of cover it all, but I appreciate that. <laughs> Always dangerous to announce yourself as a New York Yankee. I have found that out, but thank you. Go Yanks. And uh, Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to be here this morning, Maria, and, and all involved in this wonderful uh, event, in this wonderful week, in this wonderful room with so much uh, inspiration and courage and, and motivation. Um, I'm very touched. And, and, a chance to share my own story. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate in my life, to be honest with you. Um, I, I, so many people and, and helped me and believed in me and gave me that chance. And, and a lot of times people hear my story of growing up and missing a right hand and they, and they say, well, you must have been so determined and, and you're motivated. And, 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 and maybe some of that was true. But to be honest with you, I was so fortunate to have so many people in my community who helped me, who reached out to me, who were champions of change, and, and who gave me the opportunity, who opened doors for me in the spirit of the ADA. And, and, and I just want to congratulate all of you. The stories that we already heard, the more stories that we will hear. Uh, you know, these, this isn't just talk. It isn't just ideas. This is impactful stuff that you all are doing for someone who benefited from that kind of generosity. I would not stand before you if there weren't people in my community who believed, who moved beyond pessimism, you know, who believed in optimism and providing a way. You know, and if I came, I live in California, I flew across the country to be here this morning. <laughs> and I relocated, I live in, I married a California girl, so I, you know, I had to stay out there. <laughs> but I come from, and if I come to the White House to say one thing, I come from the great town of Flint, Michigan. Now, <laughs> you might not hear that a lot in this world. <laughs> Flint's a tough town. Flint's a, a town hit hard by unemployment and crime and the automotive industry moving away. And when I was growing up in Flint, Michigan, it was a tough place and no quarter was given. You had to prove yourself at each and every opportunity. But what was great about my hometown was that there were people who recognized those difficulties, who recognized the challenge that was there. And so instead of providing just the streets for kids to go to, they used to open the gyms up at night. They used to open the doors. They used to open the gyms up at night to, for kids to go play basketball, kids to go play dodgeball, kids to go play all these different things. And so growing up in Flint, Michigan, we had all these great athletes. And for a kid who grew up a little bit different, those athletes were my heroes. Those sports teams were my heroes. To be on a team like that, that varsity jacket in Flint, Michigan, meant something. That sense of belonging. And so I worked hard. But what was great about my hometown was the people. They didn't let me sit at home. They called me. They said, you can do this. And Brian mentioned doing things in a new and different way. And that's what the story of my life was. Yes, I, I grew up missing my right hand. I never wanted to make a big deal about that. There's lots of people who have it way worse than me in this world. I know that. But growing up this way, I knew what it was like to be different. And I knew what it was like to hide in the background a little bit. And what was great about Flint, Michigan, is that the parents and the coaches and the teachers and the champions of change who grabbed you by the jersey and said, you can do this. There's a way to get it done. My second grade teacher, Mr. Clarkson, Don Clarkson, he taught me how to tie my shoes. I didn't know how to tie my shoes to that point. My parents used to just tie them in a triple knot and send me to school and say, don't untie these shoes, whatever you do. And Mr. Clarkson came to the classroom one day, and he pulled me out in the hallway, and he put two chairs across from each other, and he said, you can do this. I figured out a way to do it. And he started working with those loops and those laces, and, and that's, started doing it with them, and that's the way I use to this day. Right? Because of his generosity of spirit, his optimism that there was a solution. I may not sound like a big deal, but Mr. Clarkson had two hands. And I remember him with a clenched fist trying to figure out how to work with those shoes and those loops and those laces. I played high school football. I'd never played football before. I was a try, ran a little cross country. I played a little baseball. And the head football coach at Flint Central High School called me up. 
I was sitting at home. It was a summertime football camp. It started, and he said, Jim, we need a backup quarterback this year. And we hear you have a pretty good left arm. <laughs> Get down here. You're going to play football. You're going to be our backup quarterback this year on the varsity squad. I said, well, uh, hey, coach, I've never played football before. He said, get down here, you're playing. Now, he was going to be my high school history teacher. He was a former lineman at Purdue University, so I knew I better get my butt down there to this practice. So I walked down there to this practice. Again, the doors were opened for me. I went to the equipment room. They gave me a hat, helmet, shoulder pads. I didn't know how to do all that stuff. I walked down this field. Everybody seemed to know where they were going and what they were doing. And, and, and I, we're going to state championship caliber team. And I'll never forget the generosity of those coaches. You know, the idea of doing things just a little bit differently. If I could throw the ball, I had a good left arm. But I had to get the snap in the first place. So we went out on that field, and that head coach, the offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator, they all figured out how I could take the snap. If I bet my leg just a little bit lower, if I do my right hand in the forearm, I could get the ball and pull it back. I just by doing it a little bit differently, I could get in the game. To make that handoff to the running back to my left, I couldn't hold the ball. So maybe if I just grab it and have the end of the ball, I could do that. Those little bits of doing things differently allowed me into the game. Those people who saw things different. And I brought my, I used to do baseball was the same way. I brought my glove with me. I want to demonstrate how I used to throw and catch. And uh, Brian, since you brought the idea of throwing, doing things differently, would you play catch with me just for a second? Congratulations on all your great work. You're down to Michigan Wolverine. I like that. So I really wanted to play baseball. I really wanted to play. My dad, I, I said, Dad, I'll play baseball. So he went down to the local drugstore. He bought me this really cheap plastic baseball club. Not this one. And he went out in the front yard and just tried to develop a little bit different way of doing things. And so what we did, and by the way, this is not a major ball. I put this today at the hotel gift shop. And actually, <laughs> 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 we went in the front yard and we started working on a different way to do things. And, and we tried to throw the ball in the air, drop the glove on the ground. But ultimately, what we came up with was this twisting ball. We started to catch the ball. And I turned the glove toward my body, created it with my right hand, and I just a little bit different. I let the ball fall out with gravity, see if we love it here, be able to throw it, and then finish. So then it was just a matter of what we found that way of refining and practicing and making it faster. <laughs> I was faster without a score code of winning right now. But as you all know, and, and listen, I, I know there's a ton more creativity in this room than I ever just like, but you can't always do it differently. Sometimes you have to do it like everybody else. Because they hit the ball hard enough back at me, I don't. <laughs> I think it hit hard one time. I was playing for the New York Yankees against the Chicago White Sox. Are there any White Sox fans here? Let's go tell Frank Thomas. Frank Thomas is a Hall of Fame player, and uh, he was playing for the Chicago White Sox. I knew Frank. We played on a college all-star team together. So I threw a fastball on the outside part of the plate. Frank hit a line drive that I never saw. It hit me right there. Could have been a little worse. <laughs> so I was in the Yankee dugout. I didn't have time to talk. <laughs> Frank got to go to second base, and I stood there on home plate. And I knew I wasn't going to let him knock me out of that game because I knew him because we were played on a college team together. So I got the ball back, and I looked out at him, and he was on second base. And he looked at me, and he said, are you okay? I said, yeah. He said, I hit that as hard as I could. <laughs> Sorry, Frank. <laughs>
So doing things just a little bit differently, that was the key that I took away from the panel discussion this morning. And, and it made all the difference in the world to me. And I know when we all go back out into the community, and we're all going back to inspire and talk. And, and about, but that, I think that is such a key component, the creativity, doing things just a tad differently. And I know I won't, I won't take up a lot of time. We have a lot of very important and, and great people to listen to this morning. But if I could just share with you one story uh, that I think sort of encapsulates my ideas of, of inclusiveness and, and, and finding comfort in who you are and what your abilities might be. I played baseball for about 10 years. I retired a little bit earlier than I thought I would or wanted to. Uh, Major League Baseball can be that way. It's a cruel business. Uh, but I spent a few years out of the game. I didn't know what I would do with my life. Uh, I wanted to do something important. I wanted to find some direction. Uh, but it wasn't easy. You know, Major League players and professional athletes put all their eggs in one basket. You don't always know which way to go. Uh, I had two daughters at the time. And I found out that maybe my wife was ready for me to do something at my daughter's preschool class. They put a sign outside of the door that said, do any of the dads have a job that the kids would like to hear about? My wife got there before I did, <laughs> wrote next to my name, no. <laughs> no job. So she knew that I'd see it. I'm in carpool quite a bit. So I walked up and I went to this. I said, no job. I went on the like, scratched out my name and thought about what I might go talk to the kids about. And I said, I'm going to talk about baseball. I'm going to talk about baseball. So two weeks later, I showed up to the classroom, right? And you all have been in this position. You know, you got the little kids all in a group. You got teachers over here, artworks on the wall. And I had every visual aid known to man. I knew what I was in for. I had hats, gloves, cards. I had my gold medal. I played in the Olympics. I won a gold medal. I had my gold medal with me. And I, I went in this classroom, and the kids were all lined up. And I started talking to them about all the things that I thought were important, right? Humility, sportsmanship. Their eyes glazed over. <laughs> But halfway through my presentation, a hand goes in the air. I said, yeah. Um, do you have a dog? <laughs> I said, yeah, I have a dog. But we're talking about baseball. Oh, okay. So presentation keeps going. I don't know how things are going. Another hand goes in the air. Uh, yes, little girl. Um, do you drive a limo? <laughs> Where did you, where, where you come up with that? Drive a limo? No, I don't drive a limo. I'm almost done with my presentation. Almost done. I don't think that my, made any impact whatsoever. And my own daughter, Ella, she raised her hand with all her friends there. I said, yes. And she said, Dad, do you like your little hand? I said, what? She said, Dad, do you like your little hand? And man, that question stopped me in my tracks. Did I like my little hand? Obviously, she had been thinking that with all of her friends and her teachers around. And sometimes, to be honest, I always wondered how my kids would look at me and think about me. Sometimes I hid my hand in my pocket. That was such an important question. I wanted to say something that might have an impact as young as they were. I looked at her, I looked at the students, and I said, you know, I do, honey. I like my little hand. It hasn't always been easy. I haven't always liked it. But you know what? My little hand, and I don't know where she came up with that. We never called it my little hand at home. <laughs> my little hand has taught me important lessons. You know, that life's not easy. And it's not always fair. But it's taught me this. If you can find your own way of doing things, if you can be just a little creative, if you can make the most of what you've been given, no matter what you've been given, if you can make the most of that talent and that ability, no matter where you go in this world, believe in who you are and what you can do, nothing can stop you. My little hand has taught me that. Nothing.
can stop you. And we're going to have a great discussion today. And we're going to hear from some amazing people we already have. But we're going to walk out these doors. And challenge will continue to come. Obstacles will continue to come. But it doesn't have to hold you back. If you can find your own way of doing things, believe in who you are and the difference that you can make. Amazing things are possible for each and every one of us. Amazing and great things can happen in this world. Congratulations to all the champions of change. Congratulations to everybody, especially you two over here. I couldn't type that fast to save my life. But thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor. Thank you, Jim. Um, I actually think you should get that baseball signed by all the champions and cherish it as one of your most treasured possessions. I know I would. Um, so right now we're going to take about a five-minute break. Uh, again, you know, if you need to use the bathroom or go run and grab a coffee from the cafeteria, please feel free to do so. But it's going to be a quick break so we can make sure to give our second panel enough time. Please return at 1125. Hi.
if we could please uh, get settled in our seats, we're going to go ahead and get started with our second panel. And I know that there are a lot of people probably still in line at the restroom, but I want to make sure we're respectful of everyone's time. So I would like to introduce our second panel, uh, Owning the Future, Disability, Diversity, and Leadership. Our panel is moderated by Mr. Ari Neiman. Ari is the Executive Director and co founder of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. I also want to take a moment to thank Ari for his service. He uh, just finished his last um, board meeting with the National Council on Disability. Um, on the panel are Champions of Change are Katherine Hutchinson, Mike Ellis, Max Farrows, and Talila T.L. Lewis. So, Champions, take it away. Thank you so much, Maria. It's an honor to moderate a panel with such uh, accomplished and illustrious champions of change. Um, I'd like to begin just by prefacing uh, this panel with a couple of brief words that really came to me over the course of the last week of celebration. It's, just, it's very interesting to me. When we talk about 25 years of the Americans with Disabilities Act, we're talking about a 25-year period that has affected different parts of the disability community in very different ways. In the previous panel, there was a lot of discussion about people with hidden disabilities. And, you know, as many of you are well aware from long histories of advocacy on this issue, it was really only in 2008 with the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act Amendments Act that people with hidden or invisible disabilities were fully protected by the ADA. We've talked a lot about the importance of the ADA's integration mandate and the Supreme Court's Olmstead decision for getting people with disabilities into the community and opening up the doors of community life, of welcoming people into every aspect of community life, um, whether it be residential, employment, recreational, or any number of other aspects of life. But Olmstead really only came about in 1999, nine years after the passage of the ADA. And as many of you are well aware, Olmstead was not even fully enforced by the Justice Department until 2009 and the beginning of Tom Perez's excellent work um, in the Civil Rights Division. And so when we talk about the ADA, I personally am really even more excited about the next 25 years because we now have the possibility to think about what does the disability community look like when we are approaching disability rights in a truly inclusive and welcoming way that reflects the diversity of our community. And the disability rights movement, we've often struggled with trying to figure out how to do that, how to reflect that diversity. Most of you are aware that we've often had challenges in the disability rights movement with a hierarchy of disability. Um, you know, people with mobility disabilities saying, you know, well, my body may have some trouble, but at least my mind works okay or people with cognitive or psychiatric disabilities saying, at least my body's all right. There's a tendency in many circles, and you know, for a very long time, for different parts of our community to feel pressure from society to try and climb out of marginalization by climbing on the backs of other parts of our community. That's, oh. <laughs> Okay, um, but, you know that's that's I think one of the darker parts of the disability rights movement's history, and it's a big challenge. It's a big problem, and one that really we still struggle with in a very real way. But when the disability rights movement has been in its best, it's been at the moments where we've sought out real solidarity across disability organizations, across disability groups, across disability communities, when we've said at a very basic level that we are all in this together. In the words of Ben Franklin, we're either all going to hang together or we're all going to hang separately, so we might as well all hang together. 
And, and, you know, last week I remember hearing from Kelly Buckland, the head of the National Council on Independent Living, about how when he was in Idaho fighting for the rights of parents with disabilities, not to face discrimination in the family law and child custody system, um, he was told by prominent state legislators there that they could pass their non-discrimination bill as long as it excluded parents with psychiatric disabilities. And Kelly responded, as any good disability rights advocate should, that he and the independent living movement in Idaho would oppose a bill that left out a part of the disability community. And I just, I think that really encapsul encapsulates at a very basic level what the disability rights movement and what the champions for change here today are all about. Because there's always going to be someone who's going to try and bargain with you and bargain with our movement. You can be a person. Just let me treat these people like objects. Yes, we'll recognize inclusion and rights and self-advocacy. Those are all very important things for you, but not for them. And the only appropriate answer at those moments is absolutely not. Personhood is an absolute value. That is the most important lesson of the disability rights movement, and that is the most important principle that we carry with us as we celebrate the 25 years since the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and we think about where we want to go for the next 25. And with that in mind, I want to turn to our panelists, and we're going to go, we're going to start with Palila, and then we're going to go straight down the line. And, and I'd like to start by asking the first question that we prepared for this afternoon. It's one that's really near and dear to my heart because it really it speaks to those tensions that have always existed within the disability community and that we have to continue to manage and work to try and live up to our ideals through every single day. So my first question to each of our panelists, starting with Palila, is... Who is left out of the Americans with Disabilities Act today? And where should policymakers focus on for the next 25 years of disability policy? Thank you, Ari, for opening up with um, such truth. I think so often I hear reverberated in the disability and death rights communities, this concept of nothing about us without us. Um, but it rings hollow to me so often um, because we refuse to name who is us. So nothing about us without who. Um, you know, a lot of discussion about the celebration of the ADA, which is fantastic. Our predecessors did an amazing job uh, with bringing forward such legislation, such revolutionary legislation that that set, set um, such precedent for such amazing um, future um, changes. But I think so often we forget that we should be working not just on cross-disability movement, movements, but cross-movement building. So why can't we say that Black Lives Matter? Why aren't we work? <laughs> Why aren't we working in tandem with those who are fighting for equal justice for people who are affected by mass incarceration? Um, and I would be remiss to say that, to not say that um, even here, uh, one of my invitees was a returned citizen um, who served his time, uh, who has had a beautiful life from the time he was released until right now. He is our liaison, couldn't come here because he has a criminal history. So when we talk about returning citizens um, with disabilities, 
they too are being left out of the discussion. And I think that's important to say. And I think our predecessors couldn't predict a lot of the things that would happen um, post ADA. They couldn't predict that we would have 2.8, 2.3 million people incarcerated, the vast majority of those being people with disabilities. They couldn't predict that we would have uh, our own Congress pass legislation that would make it very, very difficult for all people who are in institutions, jails and prisons, uh, the Prison Litigation Reform Act, um, to actually even um, file grievances uh, when they're being, when their rights are being violated, their ADA rights are being violated, and we have the Prison Litigation Reform Act that requires exhaustion of administrative remedies. Um, that is often a five-year process that is in writing, which means if I have a person who is deaf or who has disabilities in jail and prison, which there are many, they can't exhaust these processes. Um, they couldn't predict that these sorts of things would happen, and that is why we are all here, um, and that is why we are here to um, create changes that they couldn't have um, predicted in that time. Well, I'm glad that we are talking about the next 25 years. Um, I want to talk about employment. The Americans with Disabilities Act paved the way for creating employment opportunities for people with disabilities. But we have a long way to go. There is one massive obstacle still in the way. The laws of our land still allow people with disabilities to be paid sub-minimum wages. This would not be tolerated by other minority groups. Many of my brothers and sisters with intellectual disabilities are stuck working in sheltered workshops, segregating, and earning way less than minimum wage. People with intellectual disabilities are some of the poorest people in our country. As a top priority, we must work with policymakers to get people real jobs for real pay. Having a job is important because working makes me feel independent. It also involves me and my community so people can see what I have to offer. Having a job is a way to make friends and build relationships. I work as the outreach director for Green Mountain Self Advocates in Vermont. Working enables me to make a difference in the community with my peers. I mentor my peers to break the barriers of shyness so they feel confident to speak up in hard times. We may need support, but the truth comes from us. All of this builds my self-confidence and empowers me to make changes in my life as well as others. People with disabilities need more than ever to work in real, integrated, fulfilling jobs that will enable us to take control of our lives. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike Ellis. I work for Sprint, and it is an honor and a pleasure to be here today. To address the question, I don't believe that the ADA intentionally excluded any specific disability group. I think they weren't aware at that time of the power of the internet that was coming, the power of technology that was coming, and the ways that communication would change. So our job in addressing the internet is to look at functional equivalence, to see what access non-disabled people have and what access people with disabilities have and make sure that that equivalence exists. It can be challenging for all kinds of telecommunication services. For example, Title IV talks about telephone access specifically. And we have caption telephones, or CapTel, which provide access for people with hearing loss to be able to read and visually access a telephone call. But there are many people with other types of disabilities that would benefit from that same kind of access. People with dyslexia, other disabilities. 
but the way that the law is currently written, it is only for people with hearing disabilities. So part of our challenge is to expand the way that we define the terms within the law in order to make that access more appropriate going forward. I believe that the people left out of the Americans with Disabilities Act are individuals with acquired or traumatic brain injuries. There needs to be expanded acquired brain injury services to reach the ultimate goal for becoming one society. I am sure in our future this will become a reality. In addition, there needs to be substantial improvements in accessibility in places like doctor's offices, sidewalks, restaurants, stores, and public restrooms. I think improved community access is paramount and needs to happen immediately. One of the things that I found particularly powerful about our panelists' responses is the change in expectations that occur from generation to generation. Uh, I was two and a half when the ADA was passed. I think some of our panelists were similar ages. Some of them were a little bit older during that process. Um, but one of the th <laughs> just a tad. Uh, but one of the things that really comes out of that is we now have this whole generation of leaders who have really never known a world without the ADA. And even if that promise was not fulfilled, they came into, we came into the disability community with the expectation that these rights equal pay, equal access to the community, accessibility, inclusion in society should just be ours as a matter of course. Of course, people with disabilities should have these things. Of course, all people with disabilities should have these things. And that, that hasn't always been the case. So with our next question, I, I really I want to ask our panelists, our champions, to really speak to how they relate to the cross-disability civil rights movement. The cross-disability movement has always carried with it, as we were speaking about earlier, certain tensions, certain challenges. Where do you come from within the disability community? And because of that, how do you relate to other kinds of people with disabilities and other parts of the disability rights movement? Um, I think, so you, you all have probably heard of mad scientists. Um, now you know that there are mad activists because I, I identify as a mad activist. Um, mad in a lot of ways, but um, I do identify as a person with mental illness. Um, and that is something that needs to be stated in this space. Um, it also needs to be made clear. I think Dior did a beautiful job um, in the previous panel and has done a wonderful job um, with their work uh, related to um, dismantling the, not just the stigma but the discrimination that is, that is found within communities of color um, against people within communities of color who happen to identify as a person with disabilities, particularly as a person with mental illness. That being said, I would like to um, dispel the myth of you needing to identify as a person with disabilities to actually advance the rights of people with disabilities, right? Um, yeah. It is very much the people who are in the uh, class of the oppressors who need to be advancing the rights of those who are oppressed, much more so even um, than those who are oppressed. We should all be working together to advance human rights, and I think a large part of the problem is people not using their white privilege to advance racism, uh, or to, to, to dismantle racism, right? Not using, not using their hearing privilege to dismantle autism. Uh, which is pervasive, not just in society, but also within our structures that govern and rule the United States of America. Um, and, and, and ableism as well, right? Able-bodied people should be fighting tirelessly against ableism. Um, what we see so often is people saying, oh, well, I've never experienced that. I just, I don't know why, why are you so interested in that? Not important. 
The issue is when you see something going wrong, that you have to stand up and, and take a stand against it. And it doesn't matter whether you identify with that population. Um, allyship looks like acting um, and not being silenced, because our silence is violence when, when, when violence is being perpetuated against people who are trans, people who are black, people of color, people who are deaf every single day. And if we aren't standing up against all of these oppressions simultaneously, we're not doing a great job as advocates. Salila, one quick follow-up question before we move to our next panelist. I know a lot of folks in the community have often struggled to figure out how to balance the imperative of um, deferring to people with disabilities in leadership roles within the disability rights movement with the also very important imperative that you just articulated for allies to be proactive and think about ways that they can leverage their own privilege to advance equality of opportunity. I'm just wondering, since you spoke to that, uh, to one side of those issues really passionately, if you can just speak to how you see managing um, that particular tension? When you are a person who has a privilege, for instance, all of us here enjoy freedom privilege, um, which is a privilege that I've kind of come up with, um, it's really important to forefront those who are um, of the minority, who are being constantly oppressed. So, for instance, I obviously advocate for people who are deaf, deaf blind, deaf disabled, and hard of hearing. Um, what I make sure is that there is no space that I am in where there are not deaf people, and not just deaf people in the audience, right, because that's absurd. Um, deaf people should be at the table making decisions. Um, and my job as a hearing privileged person is to make it such that everybody in the space recognizes the power of the person who is deaf, recognizes that they have a voice and that they are in and of themselves important simply because they exist. Um, and that is our job as human beings, um, is to really put forward um, the faces, the presence, the power of all of those people who for so long have been um, just... <laughs> oppressed mercilessly by those in positions of power. And that, I think, is something that we should be doing. And that is separate and apart from the ADA. Um, and, and, and I think, I don't know if that answers your question, but does that get somewhere? Mm -hmm. It speaks to the, to the same set of issues. I appreciate you bringing that up. Max? I would like to address two issues here. Um, I will begin by explaining why the peer-to-peer -peer connections are essential, and then we'll give suggestions for improving collaborations between disability groups. I come from working and speaking up for persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities. When peers connect in the self-advocacy movement, it creates an atmosphere that feels safe. Sometimes when they go to, another, to other people, the information can be sugar-coated, feel a bit biased or controlling. With peers, the direct truth comes from us. We realize that we are not alone while facing tough times living with a disability. People feel that they belong because we are accepting and open to everybody. Through my work, I have seen firsthand the tremendous benefit of peer-to-peer -peer connections. For example, I know individuals that struggle with self-harm. Through connecting with peers, they have made great progress in overcoming that challenge. This is the power of peer-to-peer -peer connections. Sometimes it helps in ways that professional licensed therapy does not. We appreciate the funding that goes into current service systems to pay professionals to support people with disabilities. but. Out of the huge sum of funds, barely any is given to peer supports which can have a powerful impact on people's lives. In my experience, people with intellectual disabilities also benefit greatly with organizing with people with other kinds of disabilities. But inclusion is not just what we are fighting for. It must be the way we do business. That means we are fully involved and not just a fly on the wall. We need information ahead of time 
It needs to be written in a way we can understand it to be best to be best of our ability, or in other words, accessible. Give us opportunities to speak in meetings. Check in throughout the meetings to make sure everyone knows what's going on. And check in with us afterwards to see what you can do to make meetings better. This is not rocket science. People need to do it. The rewards are great. Involving people with intellectual disabilities in the same broader disability rights movement at all levels of creating change will get us closer to what we all need to succeed in life. Mike? So there were two parts to the question. Where we individually come from and how we work with other disability groups. I was born hearing and lost my hearing one week before my senior year of college. Somehow I made it through my senior year after that experience and the first disability group that really included me was Gallaudet University. I went to Gallaudet University for graduate school and became involved with the Association of Late Deafened Adults, the Hearing Loss Association of America, and the National Association of the Deaf, with whom I've been an active member ever since. So I was involved with various aspects of the hearing loss community. I've now been working for Sprint for 23 years, and it has been incredible to work with people with various kinds of hearing disabilities as well as visual disabilities. And we're working more and more with the blind community. This week I'm here in Washington, D.C. and I'm meeting with people from the National Federation of the Blind and different blind associations because we realize that we do have common denominators in terms of access and needs. Two weeks ago, I went to the National Federation of the Blind Conference and the ACB Conference as well. And I saw many of those people that were at that event using smartphones. And a lot of my work has been about how to provide access for these kinds of technologies that were not developed for people with those particular disabilities, but to adjust them in ways that make them accessible. And so the power of seeing that accessibility across disability groups is so important. And we saw that work happen with the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, where different disability groups were working together to make sure that the technology was able to be used by all members of all of those various groups. And I think that's the way we need to work moving forward. Mike, I have a quick follow-up question for you. You know, as, as you're well aware, the deaf community has often led the way in conversations around disability culture and identity, and has often in the past had a complicated relationship as to whether or not they identify as part of the broader disability community. I'm wondering if you could just speak to your views on that. Um, do you see the deaf community as part of the disability community and you know how would you describe those tensions uh, as they exist now 25 years after the passage of the ADA? I think it's very important to remember that we are all people first and as long as we realize that humanity as our common denominator Whatever the label of the specific disability is, isn't as important. Is the deaf community part of the disability community? Absolutely. We want to work for social access, for employment, for all of those same kinds of issues. We're all in the same boat, and we're working together to push things forward and so that American culture improves across all disabilities. So to that specific question, I would say yes, definitely. In order to improve real access and community integration 
It is really important that people with various types of disabilities work together in their advocacy efforts. I know working together as one disability community is really important. Obviously, my work and passion is for people with acquired brain injuries, but all disabled people need to work together to help all disabled people live independent, full lives. I think that's really well put, Catherine. I remember one of the very first advocacy campaigns that I worked on um, involving fighting back against some offensive advertisements in New York City. Uh, we uh, ended up calling Adapt, Bob Kafka at Adapt, and explaining the situation to him. And you know, we said we've got this, we've got this letter. Uh, and we're just we're hoping disability organizations will sign on to it. You know, talking about how people without disabilities are are putting out these ads that are offensive and they're doing it about us without us. And before I could say another word, Bob said, "Sign us on." I, I said, "Do you want to read the letter first? <laughs> and what he said, and I'll always remember this, is I think it really encapsul and captures captures what. Catherine and the other champions were speaking about is, um, well, you know, you're a group of people with disabilities fighting to assert your voices. We've all been there. Each part of our community has, has played that role before, and so we're going to stand in solidarity with you. I just think that's, that's critically important. Not that I recommend signing on to letters sight unseen, but that kind of solidarity is exactly what our champions, all of them, reflect here today. I want to turn to our final question, and it relates to something that's a little bit different from what we talked about at the start of this panel. The first question I asked you was about what kinds of changes we should be seeing in law and public policy over the course of the next 25 years. But as we know, we as people with disabilities, we live in a society that's made up of more than just laws and public policies. The disability rights movement has won many policy and legal victories, but much of the social and cultural change we've wanted has yet to arrive. So that's my question to you. What kinds of social and cultural changes need to occur in our society for people with disabilities beyond the reach of government? I think um, Emerson uh, said that uh, every generation has to write its own books. Um, and this is, a, this is a paraphrase, but he said that the generation before, the books of that generation before, um, their pages won't quite fit um, that of the newer generation, the later generation. And I think the same holds true for the ADA and what we're doing now. I think in every civil rights and human rights movement, you see um, integrated advocacy approaches, and it's necessary. Um, the people on the ground are the people who really make things happen, and I think that's important. Um, we can't allow marginalized identities to be pit against one another. So, for instance, um, a returning citizen or a person with a criminal history or incarcerated people who are also institutionalized. We have to acknowledge that prison is an institution um, and that most of the people who are incarcerated now with disabilities, um, studies, studies show up to 80%, 90% of people in our, in our prisons um, and jails have at least one disability. Um, we have to acknowledge that those people who are there now uh, would some 40 years ago have been institutionalized in what is now called a psychiatric hospital. Um, and if we are not advancing the rights of those individuals, then we aren't really doing our job. Um, I think we have to change our language. Even within the disability community, so many people use crazy um, as, as a um, negative. And I, and I really think that we need to uh, change our language. Um, use absurd. Use that's bananas. I use bananas all the time. That's bananas. Um, find some other way to explain.
one is not intelligent just because of outward appearances is a tragedy. Don't assume that someone with a disability can't do things on their own. We may need support, but give us the opportunity to accomplish our dreams. I know we have all heard this before, but we need to continue to hear it again and again. Nothing about us without us. Whenever decisions are made about our lives, we must be in the driver's seat. Unfortunately, society still continues to dictate what persons with disabilities are good and bad at. When in reality, everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses. I am aware of situations where people with disabilities are so used to having decisions made for them that they can be hesitant to speak up. Society needs to give us a chance. So how do we work together for change? As much as I like working with disability groups, Organizing with other groups beyond the disability community is refreshing, rewarding, empowering, and needed. I have found that people accept us for who we are. You know, there are, they're not trying to change us, but our issues become part of a bigger human rights campaign. In Vermont, Green Mountain Self Advocates spends time organizing with the Vermont Workers' Center, Migrant Justice, 350 Vermont, and Vermont Interfaith Action. If they have an appointment with the governor, they include us. They give us rides to meetings. We write press releases together. They celebrated with us when the, our governor signed the Vermont Respectful Language Bill. We organized candidate forms together. Self-advocates were involved every single step along the way. They are our true allies. We learned so much about barriers that other people are facing. We work together because we know that there is no climate change no climate justice without migrant justice. No workers' rights without disability rights. And we are all in this together as one. Thanks so much. I'm going to address this in three ways. I'm going to talk about the social the cultural, and then I'm going to add media as well. That's my third way that we're changing society and culture. There have been significant changes in terms of how social media impacts the community. And as those impacts increase, we have to take the time to think about how they're going to impact people with disabilities. So I'm thinking about things like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Videos that are posted online that are not captioned and therefore not accessible to certain people. Pictures without descriptions that don't allow blind people to have access to what's in the image. So as the social media advances happen, we need to work to continue to increase that access and make sure that the access is there for everyone. Again, I've been working for Sprint for 23 years and over those years I've seen many, many changes. The United States Business Network has established a new test for businesses to determine whether they are actually walking the talk when they talk about hiring people with disabilities. Looking at their actual reputation within the business to determine whether they are leaders in inclusion of people with disabilities in terms of employment, in terms of the job site, and all kinds of access. So we're starting to see some of those things change. My final point is about the media. And this involves everyone. 
how the media can impact the social and cultural changes that we're looking for. Anytime that you are working with media and you're going to put out a story on video, ask whether it's going to be captioned. Ask whether there's going to be visual description. Make sure that the stories that we're putting out on media are the stories we want to be telling and are being told in the ways that people can access them. And that's what's going to make the difference for our society and for our culture. I believe there is a real lack of understanding about the social and cultural world that disabled are encouraged to join when the world is dominated by the able-bodied people. I for one would like to see people focus on our abilities and not our disabilities. I believe that the goal of the disability rights movement is to reduce the marginalization of disabled persons so we can be empowered to influence social policies and practices to further the full inclusion of individuals with disabilities into the mainstream of America. I want to thank all of our panelists and all of the champions for change, not only for your participation today, but for your work and for your commitment to ongoing work on behalf of our shared community. The issues that we've spoken about, the intersection between racial justice and disability rights, the ways in which our community is at its strongest when we rally together, the challenges in thinking about how we account for the needs and be inclusive of people with acquired disabilities, people with intellectual disabilities, people with sensory disabilities, people from all different parts of our community are extraordinarily important, particularly as we think about this generational shift that's occurring with a growing number of leaders in our movement being able to take the ADA at some basic sense for granted and ask ourselves, what's the next step? What's the next opportunity to advance the goals of the Americans with disabilities? These acts, full participation, equality of opportunity, economic self-sufficiency, and independent living for all people with disabilities. This week marks the end of the ADA 25th anniversary celebration, and I know that this is a celebration that many of you have spent an extraordinary amount of time preparing for publicizing, communicating to the world, using as a point of leverage for any number of tangible and meaningful policy victories. But it doesn't in any sense mark the end of our shared work to advance full equality for people with disabilities. I'd like to close with a quote from one of the architects of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the late, great Senator Edward Kennedy. For all those whose cares have been our concern, the work goes on, the cause endures, the hope still lives, and the dream shall never die. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon.
one word that I can think of to describe that panel, and it's fierce. Um, so again, applause to all of you. Now we're, we're into the home stretch. We're going to hear from two more speakers. Earlier you heard from Jim Abbott, um, now retired Major League Baseball player, and continuing with our intergenerational theme, I would like to welcome Derek Coleman to the stage. Derek is an American football fullback for the Seattle Seahawks in the NFL, and he is the first deaf offensive player in the National Football League. Derek, please welcome. <laughs> Um, first, I want to thank you guys all for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting here and listening to the panel about uh, racial injustice and the Disability Act and all that. And then I just want to let you guys know one thing that I tell everybody. In order to accomplish all that, you have to start with one thing. You have to start with you, meaning you have to be yourself. You know, uh, I'm listening. The only thing that's going through my head is, there's no way we can do anything about the next 25 years. There's no way we can accomplish anything unless you go out and truly be yourself. Don't worry about uh, whether somebody outside wants to change this policy or that policy. Be yourself. For example, I'm going to take it back. I, uh, my name is Derek Coleman. I play football for the LC. I've been deaf since I was three. Um, lost my hearing, and it's just Honestly, to the day, I still don't know why. Do I want to know why at this point in my life? No, I don't, because it's who I am. I never once went around and said, oh, um, I have a disability. We need to do this. We need to do that. I would just look. I needed help. Yes, I needed help. I didn't ever say, oh, I can't hear, so I can't do this. I need, um, I can't hear, so I can't play football. I wanted to go out there. I wanted to have fun. I wanted to do what feels feel right for me. In order to do that, I had to basically make no excuses in anything, everything that I did. If I wanted to play football, I wanted to play basketball, I wanted to uh, get an A in class or whatever it was in my life, whatever accomplishment, whatever obstacle I wanted to do, I had to set my mind to it. It doesn't matter what any of you guys think about my goal, because at the end of the day, it's my goal, it's what I want to accomplish. And what most people don't realize is, in order to accomplish any of the things that we want to do, we have to be ourselves first. We have to bring awareness to it. I didn't, like, the people always say, I brought awareness to the hearing impaired, the deaf community. Like that, Tom. But you got too many I didn't go here. out and just say, hey, like, I don't you know, want we this. need to bring awareness. Let's go and march down the street Look, and say, you, you know, give a job, make a, uh, you know, the disability, people with disability give us better uh, money for the effort that was doing. I didn't do none of that. What I was doing was I was being myself. I would say, you know what, I'm going to go out there and be the best that I can be. Excuse me. I'm going to be the best that I can be. Now, I don't worry about what, uh, how, who this person is or who that, I, of course, I want you guys all to be with me, but once I, the best I do, I treat my dream was to to play football in the NFL. I treat that. Once I did that, people start noticing that. People start saying, oh, he has hair loss. He has a disability. But yet, he's still doing what everybody else is trying to do. I'm still doing what hearing people can do. So, it's already hard enough to make the NFL as it is, and I did it with the hearing impairment. I didn't go and... I didn't go around and uh, say, oh, you know, I, I need this, I need that. Yes, I needed help, and I wasn't shy about it. We all need help. There's not one perfect person in this world. So what makes you think that, for example, what makes you think that this person is doing more money than me, he has problems too. Mine is just more visible. Like, I have hair in love, or somebody made his body might not function, right? Somebody's brain might, but they can still do it. They put their mind to it. They really want to accomplish something. They can still do it, uh, and that's what we're. That's where we all stand. We all got to stand together. We all got to stick together. 
know, don't want to, this is, and everybody in this room who's sitting here today and your family members or anybody you know that's overcoming something, we're all we got. You know, we need to, you know, be the best that we can be. Don't worry about uh, what Obama's doing or anybody else is doing. <laughs> Let them do what they have to do. Let them be the best that they can be, and we are going to be the best that we can be. Uh, um, I was very fortunate enough, maybe about a year ago, I met a, um, a teenager. He was blind, but he was a lost now, playing football. His team helped him out. They wanted to help him because he wanted to do something. Everybody wants to help us, but in order for them to want to help us, we have to want to do what we want to do. If you want to be the next president of the United States, do it. Do whatever you have to do. Find a way. Surround yourself with people that are going to help you achieve that goal. And once you do that, it's going to grow. You know, you sit and you talk to multiple people all the time. If I talk to a group of 100 people, only one of them walk out understanding what I'm saying, and actually affected by what I'm saying, that I'm fine with that. Because that one person's gonna grow and do what he wants to do. He's gonna become somebody successful, he can become somebody inspirational or whatever it is, and he's gonna help somebody else. It's a slow process. It took twenty five years to get get to where we are today. Twenty five years ago, I'm twenty four years old. I wasn't even born when that thing. You know, but one, I want to thank every one of you guys for fighting for, like, I'm, I major in political science, but I'm going to leave all the politics to you guys. You know, and because that's what you guys do best. Like, do that, and I'm just going to be back here having fun. Same thing, we all just want to have fun. We all want to laugh. We all want to enjoy our time. We all, you know, want to have, life is already hard to do as it is. You know, like, why is everybody going to make fun? I always preach to everybody about bullying. You know, um, I was just looking at another thing. You got to stand up. Somebody being bullied, you need to stand up and talk. That doesn't mean you need to go and step in and be like, hey, uh, you need to stop bullying that person. No, it's way more than that. I always tell people the one type of bullying is when you keep bullying and you keep walking and you do nothing about it. You don't, you don't have to do nothing about it. You really right like there. You can go and tell somebody who may be able to help. You know, I'm, uh, I'm not going to get into somebody's body, somebody's bullying. Yeah, I'm big and strong and all that, but I'm not going to go in there and expose myself. I don't know what the situation is. So if I see somebody, uh, I'm going to use them because we want to see. But if I see a bomb there and somebody's getting bullied, I'm going to go tell a bomb that somebody's getting bullied. Because I know he can do something about it. You know, and it's, it's small stuff like that. That is just taking steps, small stuff. It doesn't have to be something big. Okay. Same thing we want. We have to take one foot and that's front of the other. We can't just take one big giant leap. It takes take time, it takes a while, but as long as we have each other, as long as I got my back and you got my back, I got your back and you got my back, we're all going to be fine. You know, that, that makes no sense. <laughs> you know, but I, I want to thank you guys all for having me because it's always great to see all of us just all dressed up, first of all, you know, we're just enjoying each other's present. And I'm making you guys laugh, and I don't know why. But at the end of the day, I'm just out here having fun. I don't really, the funny thing about, it, I'm in this political science, you know. Um, I had a chance to meet Amy Degard, kind of the right, and, you know, a couple different. But to me, all that is kind of pointless, you know, especially when it comes to disability, because it all starts right here. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't exactly know what you guys playing it, but for me, it doesn't matter about, I'm not going to go and petition. I'm going to go out and do me. When you do your stuff, people notice that. You have to notice somebody, you know, you might be in a wheelchair, but still doing it. You have to, that's why you have the special weapon. They're still breaking records. They're still trying to be the best that they can be. And that's why I'm leaving. Be the best that you can be, and we can be the best. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Derek. I want you to know that if you did see somebody bullied, you could actually go to President Obama. Under his administration, we've seen guidance from the Department of Education around anti-bullying efforts by, uh, for LGBT students and for students with disabilities. So I'm sure he considers himself 
an anti-bullying enforcer. Um, I would now like to welcome to the stage my old boss. He was in my new boss today. My old boss, uh, Secretary Tom Perez. Secretary Perez was nominated by President Obama to serve as the nation's 26th Secretary of Labor and was sworn in on July 23rd, 2013. Happy anniversary, Secretary Perez. He has committed to making good on the promise of opportunity for all, giving every working family a chance to get ahead, and putting a middle class life within reach of everyone willing to work for it. Secretary Perez's priorities for the department include ensuring a fair day's pay for a fair day's work, connecting ready-to-work Americans with ready-to-be-filled jobs through skills programs like registered apprenticeships and on-the-job training. In addition to his work at the Department of Labor, Secretary Perez is also a fierce advocate for disability rights in the Department of Justice. And with that, we welcome Secretary Thomas Perez. audience and there's a lot of uh, what I call serial activists in the room, uh, people who have been working so hard uh, for so long uh, to build a better America. And uh, this has been a remarkable week of reflection, renewal, and uh, reinvigoration. And I want to say thank you, first of all. Uh, and let me start off by giving a shout out to Maria. Uh, Maria is my former colleague in DOL, and Dr. Bernard and she's doing great stuff. Maria, you got games, and uh, you always have games. Uh, you know, I think, and, and, you know, there's just, I could go around the horn here and thank so many people for everything they do. I don't know if Lex is still here. It, I, it's hard to single out one person, but, you know, you think about Lex Frieden, and uh, you think about the Americans with Disabilities Act, so I think he may have had to leave, but I, I think it's important to say thank you. Uh, when, when Derek was referring to the, uh, the folks who were working on this before he was born. You just made me feel really old, sir. I just want you to know that. And, uh, and people like Lex were fighting the fight. And uh, people like Justin Dart were fighting the fight. People like George Herbert Walker Bush were fighting the fight. People like Tony Coelho and Steny Hoyer and so many others uh, were fighting the fight. I was with Tom Harkin last week. And he was fighting the fight and winning the fight, all of you. And uh, it's remarkable because I feel like I'm a student of the movement. And uh, to be here with many of the generals and the foot soldiers and uh, the heroes and heroines, uh, it is really, truly remarkable. I, I firmly believe that the most important dependent clause in America is the clause that says, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union. When I reflect on that, I often reflect on what our society has been about since its inception. And that it, we have been about the journey to form a more perfect union. That is what we have done from the beginning of time. Our, our nation was founded on the principle that we can do better, that we can enshrine principles of opportunity, inclusion, and fairness into a constitution. But at the time that our constitution was put in place, we still had unfinished business. We had to fight a civil war to address the absence of opportunity for African Americans. The journey continues. And as I reflect on the um, 25th anniversary of the ADA, that's part of the search for that more perfect union. When the ADA was signed 25 years ago, our nation continued that journey. And it was a remarkable journey. And, and as I reflect on the uh, 25 years since, I think about how we've not only been able to break down physical barriers, but we have been able to break down psychological barriers. We have been able to say that, you know what? We've got to focus more on the last seven letters of that word and less on the first three letters. As Denny Hoyer has said many times, if I could make one amendment to the ADA, it would be to change the name. 
from a, the Americans with Disabilities Act to the Americans with Abilities Act. Because what the last 25 years have been about is the demonstration of ability. You can, with your ability, pitch a no-hitter in the major leagues. And I'm a Red Sox fan. That's hard for me to say, Mr. Adder. I just want you to know, of everything I'm saying here today, I admire you so much, but I am a Red Sox fan. And that was so hard what I just said. But you demonstrate that when we focus on ability, we're there. When you demonstrate, Mr. Coleman, that you can have a Super Bowl ring when we focus on ability. I was at Walter Reed today talking to Wolf Warriors, and they inspire me. They continue to inspire me. Somebody had a shirt on that really captures the essence of what we're talking about. His shirt said, I can't fail. It's not in my DNA. That's what it's all about. People with disabilities who understand that they got game. And so I go to Northrop Grumman last week and I speak to a guy named William Thomas. William Thomas has a mobility impairment. He's a graduate of Morgan State University. His brother's a Marine. He's helping his brother by devising radar systems that are keeping his brother safe. And he is showing that his ability is what it's all about. You know, I met a couple, and we got to help a couple named Peter and Lori. Peter and Lori got married about a year ago. Peter and Lori met when they were in a sheltered workshop. They were in an employment setting where Lori was making a buck fifty-seven an hour. It was a workshop in which Lori was being told day in and day out what she couldn't do. This is your ceiling, Lori. That's effectively what she was told. Peter, this is your ceiling. And they kept saying, we can do more. And so with the help of our partnership between the Department of Justice, the Department of Labor, we were able to enable them to do more. And now he's making 15 bucks an hour. He is showing that he has ability. He is showing what one of your panelists just said before. There are no worker rights without disability rights, and there are no disability rights without worker rights. That is a statement of fact. And at their wedding, I, I don't cite Journey very often, but their song was from Journey, Don't Stop Believing. That's a true story. And the most remarkable thing about Lori is, you know what? When we first came into Rhode Island, and the we in this sentence is us and our partners, at the Department of Justice. The most worried and concerned person, understandably, was Lori's mother. Because she had grown up thinking that this was the best that Lori could do. And she was worried that we were coming in there in some form of social engineering that was going to be well-intentioned, but a dismal failure. And now she sees her daughter and her son-in-law. She never thought she'd say the word son-in-law. Living together, working, thriving, owning a car, not having to go to the grocery store and get on a bus to take those groceries home. Living independently because Olmstead stands not only for the proposition of where you live, it's how you live as well. And they are living independently. They are just as much of a hero as Jim Abbott and Derek Coleman. William Thomas is just that hero as well working to defend our nation, showing the world that his ability is what we should focus on, his ability as an electrical engineer. That's what inspires me. When I go to Walter Reed and I'm told, you know, when I'm asked the question, what do you want to do next? And the most important answer and the most frequent answer we get is, I want to go back and serve my nation. That's what we get. And that's why when we think about the unfinished business, because today is not simply a day of celebration. Today is a day of reflection and renewal. And the most important piece of unfinished business in the ADA 25 years later remains employment. Because for every success story like Jim Abbott and Derek Coleman, and William Thomas and Peter and Lori, there are way too many people living in the shadows. Hubert Humphrey once said that the moral test of our strength as a nation is how we treat those in the dawn of life, our children, how we treat those in the twilight of life. 
the elderly, and how we treat those in the shadows of life. And there are too many people with disabilities who are living in the shadows. We've seen the unemployment rate of people with disabilities go down, but it's way too high. We see a labor force participation rate that's still slightly over 20%. I don't meet a lot of people who come up to me and say, Tom, I want to be a taxpayer. But I meet people with disabilities all the time who tell me, I want to be a taxpayer. I have game, and I want to get in the game. And that's why we have events like Champions for Change. Because there are so many employers out there who understand that hiring people with disabilities, as I heard last week when I visited Northrop Grumman, is not an act of charity. The New York Yankees didn't put Jim Abbott on the mound as an act of social engineering. The Seattle Seahawks didn't win a Super Bowl because they decided to engage in social engineering. They all succeeded because they wanted the biggest and best talent. And that's what they got. That's what Northrop Grumman got when it hired William Thomas. That's what Peter and Lori's employers are getting when they hire Peter and Lori. And that's the unfinished business. We've got to scale the progress that we've taken and made. And we've got to sustain that progress. That's why I'm so proud of the work that my colleagues have done at the Department of Labor implementing Section 503 regulations that are designed to address the unfinished business of America in the ADA context, which is employment. That's why I am so proud to see so many colleagues in our sister agencies of the federal government recognizing that we're all in this together. That's why I was so proud Saturday to be in West Virginia talking to governors about disability employment. It's not a partisan issue there. It's not a partisan issue here. I was proud to sign a letter with the governor of South Dakota, the son of two parents who are deaf, and the governor of Delaware, Jack Markell, who made disability employment his number one focus when he was chair of the NGA. We're all in this together. And there's a guy I met a while back in this work who continues to inspire me, and I think he highlights the movement that we need to continue here. And his name is Randy Lewis. Some of you may know Randy. Randy was a former senior executive. Anyone from Walgreens in the world here? Randy was a former executive at Walgreens, the father of a son with autism. And the privilege of raising a child with autism taught Randy that the Americans with Abilities Act ought to be put in place at Walgreens. And as a result, when I visited, along with my colleague Eve Hill, who I'm confident is or was here from the Department of Justice, a disability rights heavyweight in her own stead. And when we visited there, we visited the Walgreens Distribution Center up in Connecticut. They distribute products at all Walgreens stores from Maine down to Baltimore City. And 40% of the people working there are people with disabilities working side by side with their colleagues, with a career pathway, understanding. And by the way, that's the most um, efficient distribution center in their network. So again, they're demonstrating what Jim Abbott did when he pitched in the major leagues. And as the father of a 13-year-old who would like nothing more than to be a major league ball player, um, I had a major league career in mind. I'm Dominican, but um, I have deceptive speed on my fastball. It's slower than you think. So that was a problem that I had, Mr. Abbott. And I had deceptive speed on the base paths. I was slower than you think. And that was a problem. And my son, despite his uh, desires, is part of his father's gene pool. I'm sad to say. But it won't stop him from trying. And I digress. And what I learned from Randy was that this can be done. And Randy has evangelized. And now we see other big box stores doing the same. That's success at scale. And what Randy said to me, you know, Randy's from the business community. I'm in government. We work with other state government partners. We have our nonprofit leaders here. 
We have so many others here. We have our philanthropic partners. We have our partners from Congress. And what Randy said is, you know, Tom, you and I may play different instruments, but we're in the same orchestra. And it's the orchestra of opportunity. And what we need moving forward, and this is what I leave you with, is we need to build a bigger orchestra. Because that orchestra has brought about great success over the last 25 years. We have more federal employees with disabilities on board now than we've had in literally 33 years. And we continue to do work in that area and have great success in that area. And I'm proud of that. And that's a function of leadership by President Obama, leadership at an agency level, and your help making sure that we're building that pipeline. But we've got more work to do. We need a bigger orchestra. Because I still talk to way too many people who are in the shadows. People who have gained, who haven't yet gotten in the game. And when you have a labor force participation rate of 21% for people with disabilities, that is a bellwether of the unfinished business. So let's keep building that orchestra. Let's make sure that we continue that unfinished business. Because as I learned this morning, everybody I've met in this movement understands what was on that t-shirt of the wounded warrior I saw this morning. We cannot fail. We will not fail because it is not in our DNA. So let's build a bigger orchestra. Let's make sure that orchestra crosses America. Let's make sure opportunity is indeed the reality for everyone. And when we do that, we build a better America. We build a more competitive America. And we build America in which the journey, as I've described, the unfinished business, that search for a more perfect union, gets that much closer to success. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it indeed bends toward justice. But you know what? It does not bend on its own. And so that's why we need this orchestra at work. And I am confident that you will all leave this room today because you've been doing it all your lives, following what one of my heroes said, and that is John Lewis. When his parents asked him, John, what are you doing down there rabble rousing? You causing trouble? And he said, no, Mom, no, Dad, I'm causing good trouble. We have an ADA because... So many people cause some good trouble. We have success with this ADA because people like Derek Coleman, people like Jim Abbott, people like William Thomas, people like Lori and Peter, they understood that laws are only as good as how they are enforced and who they benefit. And they have made sure that America knows that people with disabilities got game. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for being part of this movement. Let's expand this movement. Let's build this orchestra. Let's make sure that everyone who can work, wants to work, will work. That's the unfinished business of this movement. And let's do it together. Perez, it's very clear that you got game, my friend. Um, so this concludes our Champions of Change program, and before you all um, leave, I want to say a couple of thank yous. I want to say thank you to our interpreters who've been working so hard to create Access for All. <laughs> Similarly, I want to say thank you to our captioner who is in the room and our captioner who is working virtually so that this is captioned as it's live streamed. I want to say thank you to our Champions of Change for all of your work leading up to this point and all of the work that I know you're going to do going forward. In particular, I want to say thank you for the work you had to do for this honor. A lot of people think that you know getting an honor from the White House is, is so cool. But I want to let all of you know that each of these champions did a lot of work leading up to this moment to prepare their thoughts and their remarks, 
there was a lot of coordination that in, went into it. And when we yeah. talk about labor and time and presence, we have to acknowledge that. So I want to acknowledge that and say thank you, all of you, for your thoughtful work. Similarly, I want to give a thanks to all of you in the audience. It's been um, a long and wonderful week for the disability community, but as happy and excited as everyone is, there are a lot of people who are running on low. Um, and so I, I really appreciate your presence being in the room and staying with us and your presence moving forward over the next 25 years. And so um, with that, I just want to leave you with two words, words from one of our fellow activists who is no longer here, but whose spirit is always with us, and that is lead on.